Gig Gab, episode 168 for Monday, June 4th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Simple Contacts, where at uh, simplecontacts.com slash gig gab, you can go and use coupon code gig gab to save 30 bucks off of your first order of contacts. We will talk more about that shortly here in Durham, New Hampshire, at least at the moment I'm recording this. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing pretty good, man. I got an interesting thing to kick us off today. All right, go. I want to talk about the art and science of no. <laughs> yeah. So, and here's what I'm thinking about. Is, is, this, is, is, this, is this my small business show podcast or is this, this could be well, any you know, it, podcast. It's great. It is. I it's like a, it. yeah. it's a universal thing, but, and, but it's, uh, uh, as it pertains to our life and music, it's an interesting thing. So, I uh, get asked a fair amount of time, hey, man, we should do something together. Yeah. Right? We should do something together. And this could be, you know, musicians who want to play together. This can be, you know, what it often means is, hey, man, get a gig and invite me to play, you know, like, (laughs) or invite me to invite me to sit in or, 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 and many permutations of that. You know, I'm, I'm doing something. Uh, you know, I've had a singer or two, you know, say, hey, we should do something together. They come see me do a solo thing. They say, oh, I'd like to do that. Uh, some of them are, are rank amateurs. Some of them have some experience. Some of them are, you know, real experience. And they say, you know, hey, you know, I'd love to do something with you, which again, you know, to me means get a gig and invite me to be a part of it. But that aside, any permutation of this, hey, man, we should do something together. Uh, there's stuff you want to do. There's stuff you don't want to do. Yep. There's reasons you want to do stuff and there's reasons you don't want to do stuff. There is an art and a science to saying no and keeping people happy. No is is almost by definition a confrontational, contentious thing. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. It's be- well, you're injecting you're injecting uh, um, friction, uh, disappointment. Yeah. Friction and disappointment. But but really, when the wrong opportunity, I don't want to say the wrong person, but when the wrong opportunity shows up. Like, like perhaps whatever, whatever's at your door right now that your, your dog Jeez. wants to know about. Uh, but perhaps when, when the wrong opportunity shows up, there is already friction and disappointment in the formula. It's either on your side by saying yes and absorbing that friction and disappointment and doing the thing the, the other person asked. Or you get to put it on their side by saying, no, I'm not going to do that thing that you want. You get the friction and disappointment. Well, I guess you both experience the friction there. But but, you know, that's I, I think I think that perhaps is a good way to frame this discussion. Like it's already there by 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 the ask happening. Right. And you there, just get yeah, to exactly. Decide. Yeah. However, in the universe, there are certain type of people who intuitively or because they've practiced it have mastered the art of saying no and making you feel good about it. Yes. That is an amazing skill to have. I mean, I would say right up next to being able to remember the names of the people who come see you and greeting people and, you know, you know, being able to, to kind of like naturally schmooze people yeah. and engender people, the art of being able to say no and having someone say, Oh yeah, I totally get it, man. Totally cool. And you know, them walking away feeling really good about that interaction That's an amazing skill to have. Yeah. And I suppose it's the the trick to that. And I've certainly experienced the ability to do that, but I've also experienced the ability to not do that. Um, So uh, I I, I guess the, 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 the deal is making making it about the opportunity that you're saying no to and not the person that you're saying no to. Yes. Well, sort of. I mean, <laughs> well, no, no, hold that up to the light because, you know, there's a certain value to the genuineness, you know, of, of why something's not cool. Because if you, if you're really obtuse about it, 
I'll, just to take a little tangent here. Sure. I'm a New, I'm a New Yorker by birth and a Californian most of my life. And I, and I and was I think, born close enough to New York to I think I know what you're under what you're where you're going for here. But yeah. It it seems like there's an uh, endemic personality trait that if you're a Northeaster, you kind of say what's on your mind. And if you're a Californian long enough, you try to be nice about a situation and a North, a Northeaster can smell that and actually takes quite a bit of umbrage to it. Yep. They, that's right. they would re, they require some, some genuineness in, in their response. They can take bad news, you know, but you know, be real with me is, you know, kind of the thing. Yeah, so be, be real. Don't be fake about this. If you, if you want to say no, just say no. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, let's have lunch. Oh yeah. You know, I'd, I'd love to, you wouldn't love to right? that type of thing. So, so I, I, as I hold this you know, thing of saying no up to the light, making it about the situation as opposed to the um, as opposed to the person, I guess, you know, or, or is it about you? Is it like, you know, I'm I'm really busy and I'm really careful with my time. And so tell me what you're thinking, you know, and, and maybe if you drill down to it like, and again, who, who would get this gig and, or, you know, what is the scenario that you'd like to do? You know, not not kind of like embarrass the person, you know, cause someone wants to do something with you. That's quite flattering. That's cool. But, totally. you know, but, uh, you know, coming up with that rhyme or reason by which like, uh, I would love to hear what you're sounding. Like. And, you know, maybe, maybe we could jam someday right now, you know, just my schedule is not, not cool for something like that. And maybe, you know, or again, it, it almost goes back to our conversation about sit-ins. Sometimes you just say, I don't do sit-ins. Like, just like, I'm not taking on any new projects right now. I'd love to hear what you sound like. Tell me where you're playing. I'll come hang with you sometime. But, you know, right now, you know, I've got all I can handle. And, you know, maybe that's a, maybe that's a good way to do it. Or it's like, you know, why don't you want to do something with someone? You know, is it, is it your own problem or your own fear? Is it, you know, the person doesn't, isn't talented enough for you or is it too talented and you, you know, you're in, intimidated by why you want to do them? What is it? But, you know, I guess in part of that art of no is having a pretty good, honest look at yourself and where you're coming from when you're going to say no. Right. I mean, do you have time? Do you want to do it? Do you right. like to sit in with people? You know, and maybe that's where the honesty comes from. Like, you know what? I just don't jam, you know, I kind of have my band and I do this thing and you know, that that's, that's my thing, but I don't, I don't really do sit-ins. It's just, it's, it's just so hard, but you know, thanks so much for asking. I'm very flattered. You, know, maybe so you have to be careful with that though, because that, if that's true, then you're fine. But if it's not true, be then, true, then, well, Absolutely. but yeah, I like it. You, you know, when people ask me, Oh, I'd love for, you know, you to join my band or, or whatever. It's like, well, you know, if I say I don't have time for that right now, and then three weeks later, I wind up playing with somebody else, you know, that person's going to going to realize what they're going to think. Wow, he lied to me. And that's I, I, I feel like lying to someone just to save their feelings in, in a scenario like that, where it's provably I, I, lying to people in general is just a bad idea because it's hard to keep your I've story agreed. straight. Right. You know, absolutely. But but it, there are those scenarios where we can all justify, well, I didn't want to hurt that person's feelings. So I lied to him. Right. And it but the problem is that it winds up catching you up in this disaster of a cascading series of, you know, hurt hiding feelings. things hurt. It, eventually it's hurt feelings. Right. And potentially burned bridges. Right. So it's way easier. Of course, this is me, you know, grew up, you know, what, 10 minutes from the New York border, uh, you know, talking. So I definitely am, am of that, that, you know, New York, New, Northeastern mindset of, yeah, I'm just going to tell it to you straight. Sometimes people don't hear what you tell them though. And that's, mm. that's the problem. Like I'll try to be nice. Like, I mean, there's, there's different ways of saying no, right. You can say, Hey, you know, will you play a gig with me? And I could say, uh, no, I, I will never play a gig with you. I hate you. Right. I mean, that's like, <laughs> right. You could do that. Like, I, like you are untalented and there's no way in hell I would ever play with you. That's one way, but there's the, you know, the sort of the other extreme is, Hey, you know, I'm really flattered by that. Um, now is the wrong time. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, the problem is some people get the message when you say now is the wrong time, right? Other mm -hmm. people, you know, are either pushier or maybe don't pick up on the social cues 
And it's like, well, when would the right time be? What, what, you know, what if we, you know, only have to rehearse once? Like they'll start creating, you know, whatever reason you give them, they'll start being, you know, the pushy salesperson about it. And, oh, you gave me a rejection. Okay, perfect. I'll take that away. Great. And, and that's when it can get to be very, um, Delicate, right? And difficult because it's like, okay. Well, there's a couple of things in there, Dave. So, so one is again, and you and I will both agree. There are some people who are really intuitively good at this. Yes. They basically say, oh man, you know, sounds cool. I, I, I'm just not in a place where I can do that. And you will walk away going, oh, he gave me respect. He, you know, he acknowledged what I want to do. He was, he was real. And, and, you know, I can walk away from this, from this discussion, you know, Having an answer high. to my request. Yep. Yeah. You know, every, every, everything was cool about it. What, what the problem is, what typically happens is, uh, you know, the person asking you, they either know or they don't know that they're basically saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to take a chance here and see if that person is interested in me. You know, it's like dating, right? You know, right? putting yourself out there. Yeah, right. Totally. And, you know, I may get an answer that's, that's satisfactory. I may not get an answer that's satisfactory or, you know, they don't know. They don't know what they're, which is probably, you know, more often the case, you know, they don't really realize what you're asking this person who clearly already has something going on. Um, you know, do you want to, do you want to, you know, create more time for me? I'm so wonderful. I'm, you know, I'm so valuable. Right. I, I do think that, you know, um, and you and I have worked in the professional business where we worked with a big company that had perfected the culture of no, but rarely did you walk away feeling satisfied from that. You're more like, you know, the gods on high have said no and, <laughs> and, you know, knows just the answer. We've both experienced that very unsatisfying, but I think, you know, especially if you're a musician, if you live in a music scene, if you, um, if you care about a music scene and, you know, you want to be that type of person that lifts people up and lifts other musicians and lifts your scene up. If you want to be, if that's who you are and what you're about, you know, finding, Thinking about that that art and science of no, I think, is a pretty smart thing to do. And again, I think you're right. The, the best advice is you start from a place of real. Real might be, I'm just not doing anything new, you know, right now. But, new be, might, but uh, make sure that's true. If, yeah, or if, real might be, you know, yeah. I'm, 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 you know... I, I don't know. I don't know if you and I would be able to work together. I totally appreciate the thing that you're that you're bringing here. But I have a I have two friends. Um, both of them are real hard headed, re- real strong personalities. Yeah. Um, and w- one of them has subbed for the other guy a few times, uh, enough times where it became an offer to join a group. And the guy just said, dude, you're an eyes personality would would likely wreck a friendship and you know i don't know that we would be that satisfied creatively you know making music together on an on on a permanent basis yeah you know let, let's just call a spade a spade here and that you know that was a yeah i think that there's something in that that if somebody can't hear the truth that's actually not your problem right if someone if you if you are going to be straight with someone and say you know what i'm i'm you know i'm just not sure that you and I would work well together i'm you know there's a certain thing i hear in my head and you know that's what i'd like to hear again if you're if you've made some kind of value judgment about someone, you know, that they're not a nice enough person or not a good enough person or not a good enough musician, um, you know, what are your tactics for letting someone down easy? And I actually think letting someone down easy is, is a good tactic. If someone, you know, there's a, there's a woman in my scene who, um, she wants to be in the scene and, you know, she's making, um, she sings fine. Good. Sure. Right. Um, uh, but she wants to, you know, pass go and go immediately to paying, playing the best clubs. She hasn't been in a band. She's a good natural singer, sure. but she hasn't paid any dues and she hasn't done any of these types of things. And she wants to go right to, you know, in front of the line. And um, I'm there's very careful. There's nothing wrong with wanting that. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting that, but you, you, again, self-awareness is a beautiful thing. You right. should... You should read the tea leaves when people who have paid dues. And again, I'm, I'm big on all that type of stuff, paying dues, giving respect. I, that type of stuff is meaningful to me. Yep. Um, but, you know, I didn't say, hey, dude, you got to you, know, you, you got to cut your teeth. I, I'm more like, you know, here's some club owners. You might want to talk to them. They're probably going to ask you because she, she, they had asked me for some um, 
leads and contacts, you oh, know, sure. which again yeah. is, which is a whole other set of oh, things, that's right? A, like that's a di- almost a different conversation. That's right. Yep. Right. You know, like th- this thing that I've busted and bled for, you know, building my database, you know, my contact list together, you want me to just hand it over that, you know, yeah, that's another conversation. But anyway, but so what I say is, you know, I happy to give you a couple cause we know each other. Um, just know they're usually going to say, what's your draw? What's, what's your, what's your track record? Where have you played? You know, yeah. are you ready to answer those questions? So again, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's educating someone. Yeah. Again, it's, it's confrontational by nature. Someone wants something from you. Well, and, and, you know, you kind of have to, I always have to remember and I don't right. But, uh, to remember that they are the ones that started the confrontation. Mm. Right. And and now they might be completely unaware of that. And that gets very it's difficult to deal with. But, you know, the confrontation has started by you asking me this question. You know, presumably, you know something about me, uh, especially if it's with music. But but business, I mean, it, it you know, like you, it, it happens to me in, in all kinds of different things. You know, you have a little bit of success. You're a person that's driven to get things done and other people want to do stuff with you. And sometimes it's absolutely the right you know, the right mix and the right person. It's like, whoa, this would be a great opportunity. And other times, maybe even most of the times it's okay. So, you know, I'm going to be lending something more to this than, than I'm getting out of it. And, uh, you know, that, that can also be okay. I mean, like when I'm asked to, you know, help out or coach at the school with the, like with the rock band club that I did for a while. Like, of course I'm, I'm putting more into that than I'm getting from it, Yeah, but for sure, you know, but like, I, that's something I like to, I, I'm helping, I'm passing it along. Like the world is better for that. I think so. It's great. You know? And so, it, but you have to, you have to remember that, that the people that are asking are, are the ones, the, the, the onus should be on them to make this a pleasant interaction. But unfortunately, well, maybe that's it. it's maybe not. it's like, yeah. maybe that's it. Maybe it's like, what do you have in mind? <laughs> you know, mm. you know, we should do something together. What do you have in mind? And, you know, if they're going to say, I'd love to sit in with you, then you can address that. If they're going to be, I want to start a band with you. You might be able to address that if they're going to be like, you know, I'd love to, you know, I have a friend who has a, a, a restaurant and, you know, he wants someone to, you know, provide some music, maybe it'll lead to a gig for you. So maybe that's that's one of the keys to unlocking the next step is what I do you like got in this, mind? I like this question because it yeah. does it 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 appropriately shifts the burden or places identifies the burden on the person that's asking the scenario. What do you have in yeah. mind? Yeah. Tell me about it. And then, you know, you, but you, at some point, you know, you have to be very careful to clearly say if if your answer is no, you need to say that as soon in the process of you, as you can. Like if somebody comes up and says, I'd love to play some music together and you know that the answer is going to be no. I don't know that asking them, what do you have in mind is the right thing, right? You're stringing them along to an eventual no. And the more you string them along, the harder it is for them to hear yes. that eventual no, right? And that so, creates a lot of animosity. That's where things get really touchy. Yeah. yeah. So um, so just, you know, being careful of of that, uh, you know, you don't want to string somebody along. I mean, it's it's the classic thing that happens with, you know, some somebody that wants to date somebody else, right? And if you don't turn them down right away, they'll think that you're not going to turn them down. And right. that can, you know, we, we've all seen, well, hopefully we've all, we all understand that concept. So it's like, yeah, no, sometimes you just need to make it clear. No, it's cool. We can be friends. We're not going to date in this way. We're not going to play music together. We're not going to go into business together. Whatever it is, that's not going to happen, but this can still, like the cool thing where we do and have lunch. I like this. I don't want to change that. And, and I've said that to some people, but again, honestly, where, you know, it's like, Oh, wouldn't it be great to be into business, in business together. And I, it's sometimes I'll say, yeah, I, you know, I, I have a general rule that I have broken from time to time and I've paid for it where I don't go into business with friends, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but sometimes it works out great. And then where it gets weird is when you go into business with someone and then become friendly and still remain in business. People say, well, you're friends with that person and you're in business. It's like, okay, now I have to explain my entire life to you. Yeah. I, you know, I'm like, and that's why I don't tell people I don't go into business with friends anymore. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's true. And I have my own set of metrics, but you know, instead of saying that I'll say, yeah, you know, I don't want to ruin what you and I have. I don't need to say anything generally. I don't want to ruin what you and I have. I like this. 
let's keep this where it is. It's yep. all good. Y- you know, and then that's fine. And, and, you know, we can talk about if you're going to do this project, that sounds great. If you, you know, you want to at lunch, ask about it or tell me how it's going. I can, I'm happy to talk about it as friends would, but there's, you know, setting that line where it's like, yep. Okay. Your new band is cool. You and I can talk about it. It's not weird. I'm not wanting to be in it. You know, we know that I'm not going to be in it. We're not going to be in that particular project together. And that's all right. I don't know. That's where I go with it. Well, I, I, and the other side of it is true as well. I've had like really great musicians. I have this one friend, Aaron Madsen, amazing guitarist, really, really good. Um, he's got a band that does, he's had for years and years and years, it does originals and, you know, it was recorded and actually got airplay and, and he plays in a local cover band with another buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, we just got to know each other and he was like, yeah, we should jam together sometime. And I was like, yes, this guy, I want to play with. I so, want this, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, A, I, uh, because the band he plays in is led by another friend of mine. I, you know, was, hey, are you cool on a night you're not playing if I ask Aaron to sit in with us? So I, you know, check that box. Yeah. And then um, uh, that was when I put together that classic rock night. And just like, who are some people who I, you know, that are collections of people that have said, let's do something that I, that I wanted to do something with. Now, that's that actually creates more of a problem for me because anybody watching that, it goes like, well, clearly, you know, those who he wants to do, he'll find something. To do. So yes. I'm going to create my own problem there. Yes. But, yes. but my point of this part of the story is that there are those like, Hey, we should do something together that are truly altruistic, that are truly win-win that are truly yep. mutually beneficial and great experiences and definitely worth exploring those types of things. I got a lot out of playing with Aaron. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I always, I love playing with lots of different people. It is part of what has made me, you know, the versatile musician that I am. Right. And I, and I, I continue to want to like expand that. And so I will happily sub with, you know, people, if I'm available, I'll do it. My problem with that is I, invariably I enjoy it. Right. You know, I mean, some, sometimes I don't, but by and large, you know, I get to play good music with people that are, you know, I'm, I've known or I'm friendly with or whatever. And then it always happens. It's like, oh, hey, uh, so do you want to be the, the, you know, the drummer in our band? And it's like, oh, I would love that. Like, because, you know, we're in the the the, gl- the afterglow of this game that we played. And it's like, oh, I don't know. Like, I'm creating a problem for myself <laughs> Here again. We go. Here we yeah. go. Like, I don't know. I don't want to say no. But logistically, I cannot say yes. You know, and that kind of thing gets really difficult for me. And I struggle with it and, and I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of it right now. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the art, the art of no is something that's a good skill for mus- musicians to have, whether you're, whether you're, you know, kind of a leader, like mm-hmm. a band leader, or a scene leader or something like that. Or even if you're just, you know, an individual musician saying no, but not cutting off a, uh, but not cutting off a contact. Maybe you get offered a gig and you, you know, you don't want to send someone away and you know, that they'll never call you again because of the way you say no. Right. So just thinking about, you know, a, a request creates a, it could be a confrontation, could be an opportunity. And if you, if you, if you view these things, if your worldview is that all interactions are an opportunity and you never know where something to lead and you can't have too many friends or can't have too many supporters. And you, when you want to try and start framing your nose in, in terms of, instead of letting that kind of confrontational aspect kind of guide you, you know, find, find your way to win, win, I guess is the advice that I would, that I would put yeah. there, you know, be honest, be cool. Um, you know, if you're not good at being political, don't be political, right? You know, that. Yeah. Don't, yeah. You know, know your, and, know your limitations. Yeah. No, absolutely. Know thyself. So anyway, yeah. interesting conversation. I don't know that we solved anything. Maybe we raised a couple of, you know, good points here. You know, what do you got in mind might be the most useful thing here. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've learned something about this. You know, it's always, I, I, I often feel like I'm the one that learns the most when we, when we get together and actually I like <laughs> those episodes the best. So there you go. Hey, cool. uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor, which is simple contacts. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, go to simple contacts.com slash gig gab, or at simple contacts.com use coupon code gig gab at checkout to save 30 bucks off of this really cool contact lens service uh, store, whatever you want to call it. Uh, But it is more than just a store because this is 
stuff, uh, medical stuff. So you can't just go and buy it, but you can go to Simple Contacts and just buy it because the way it works is you go there, you're a contact lens wearer. My wife is a contact lens wearer, right? And so she did this with me and it was fantastic. Uh, you go to the website, uh, they ask you to input details about your prescription and then they have you do an eye exam with your contacts in and it tests your vision to make sure that you're still seeing things the way you're supposed to with your lenses, i.e. confirming that your prescription works. And you, you pay 20 bucks for this vision test compared with like, you know, a doctor's appointment where not only is it going to cost you probably 10 times that, but you also have to schedule it and go there. This takes like 10 minutes or less and you do it in your home. You could do it in your underwear if you wanted, although your phone's camera is going to be on. So, you know, pick, pick and choose. But uh then you do this. It's it's looked at by, uh, you know, by a licensed ophthalmologist. And uh, this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. It's just to confirm your, your prescription. And then you can order contacts. And the cool part is you use your phone to scan the barcodes on your on your existing contacts. It'll find the exact model. So you don't have to figure that out and guess wrong. And then the only thing that's different is the prices. They're way lower than you're paying at your eye doctor or anywhere else. So you got to check this out. It's really amazing how well this works. Uh, you go to simplecontacts.com slash giggab and, uh, and or just use coupon code giggab uh, at Simple Contacts. And that saves you 30 bucks off of your first order. Our thanks to Simple Contacts. At simple context, simplecontacts.com slash giggab for sponsoring this episode. Thanks to a cool sponsor. Thanks. Thanks. All right, man. So, uh, you know, the other night I saw, uh, I went and saw Dead and Company, which is the current incarnation of uh, not quite a cover band playing Grateful Dead music, right? It's the two original drummers. So uh, Bill Kreutzmann and, and Mickey Hart. And then Bob Weir on rhythm guitar and, and vocals, right? And and joining them are uh, O'Teal Burbridge on bass, which I've got so a lot good. to say about O'Teal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then John Mayer on guitar and Jeff Comenti on keys. And so let me, let me talk about the those three guys, the, the, the quote unquote new guys, the add-ons, the fill-ins. Those three guys make this gig for me. Now, I, I have to tell you, I've never been a huge fan of the Grateful Dead Live. That, that might sound strange because you all know I'm a Fish fan. I've, I actually really like a lot of the Dead's uh, studio albums. Uh, I think they've written some great songs. I just never was a fan of how they chose to take the stage live. Uh, I To, to kind of put a button on it. I always felt like they needed a producer on stage saying, Hey, this thing that we're in the middle of doing right now, isn't really working. We should change. Uh, I never got the feeling that they had that on stage. Uh, so they, like their improvs never really did it for me. Although there were moments of course, where, where they had brilliance and, and I get that that was the whole thing. Um, but I've only seen, this is, this was my third time seeing the, the dead. I saw the dead once with Jerry. I saw him once when they toured as further, which was, you know, um, Bob Weir and Phil Lesh with other people. Uh, and then, and then this one and O'Teal, Mayer and Comenti, these guys, I mean, obviously each one of them can play. And, and maybe that's not obvious to people that know John Mayer from his, you know, pop realm stuff. Trust me when I say John Mayer. Oh, man. Yeah. No, he's world class. I mean, I, you're right. You know, he he started as, as kind of a pop idol, you know, stuff, which I think cemented some people's perceptions of him. Definitely. But yeah. but then, you know, he went into that hardcore blues trio stuff. And, yes. you know, and his live his live music shows he plays. I mean, he is a master at his instrument tone, taste, technique. I mean, he's just He's amazing, and um, really is. when they, yeah. when they when they announced that he would be, uh, it made total sense to me that it, that he also loves to show his chops. You know, he yeah. also loves to, to to stretch out a little bit. Totally makes sense that this is a dream gig for some. In the same way that when Hornsby tours with them for a while, it made yes. total sense. Yep, I, I totally agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I love John Mayer. I love him in an almost unnatural way. <laughs> <laughs> His playing just just makes me sore. It's just awesome. He, he's a fantastic player. And he's a he's a oh, I mean, the Grateful Dead were never really known for their vocal abilities. But um, 
John Mayer's an okay singer with them. I, I, his voice isn't perfectly suited to what they do. What does he sing? Uh, let's see. He sang, I'm pretty sure he sang Althea the other night. He sang uh, parts of Touch of Grey. Um, did he sing Scarlet Begonias? I think he did. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to hear that. Well, what you really want to hear, though, is O'Teal sing. Oh. That guy, definitely the best voice on the stage, um, without question. And he sang Fire on the Mountain. And as soon as he opened his mouth, it was like, oh, holy crap. Like this but that's guy like can... that Southern gospel, you know, amazing, yeah. you know, deep, resonant, you know, just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a vocal quality you don't hear over dead songs. I, I can't even think of anybody who's covered dead songs that you would, that you would hear right. that. Right. Totally. No. So, you know, but and and Comenzi added a lot. Uh, he didn't sing anything lead the night that I saw him. I don't think he does at all, but he sang a lot of harmonies. And and the three of those guys sing in tune well together and they blend well together now. So um, and, including Bob Weir Bob, and Bob's voice still sounds great. You know, he, how big a place did they play? It was uh the Great Woods, whatever Great Woods is called these days, man, the Xfinity Center, I don't know, it was a 20,000 person venue, right? And it was okay. essentially sold out. Yeah. So, um, and the, the way those guys, especially those three, you know, new guys play together, everything sort of stays in the box, right? They color inside the lines. So it reminds me more of a Dave Matthews type show mm. in terms of the jamming goes, right? You're, it's all happening within the structure of the tune for the most part. Uh, Which is actually the opposite of the fish experience, right? Um, fish does both. Y y you know, fish fish actually lives within the structure of the tune quite a bit. And, and then they will take it out. Um, but, you know, those guys, those guys took what the dead did. And and added that producer element, right, where they all are intently listening to each other and and sort of, you know, um, making decisions as they go about, OK, is this working? Is this not working? And it's become, you know, just fundamental to the way they they play because they've been doing it for 30 years. But um, but definitely Fish will take it out. The Dead would take it out. That's hard to do with a band that's just, you know, three years old or whatever, um, where they don't know each other like like, you know, like those guys. Um, did they didn't grow up right. together musically, you know, um, but uh, but, you know, with that, Comenti an amazing keyboard player and he and Mayer had some really nice moments. They played uh, Eyes of the World, which, if you don't know, it is a tune that kind of grooves along in seven and. Um, and and he Comenti and Mayer Comenti took a great solo all by himself and then and then he and Mayer were trading fours back and forth and and then O'Teal took a solo and it I mean it just really elevated the experience from uh, from you know th those guys those guys approach improvisation more like jazz musicians would than than say members of the Grateful Dead would right where um, where they're they're thinking about the structure and soloing in the form and all of that stuff. Uh, and it, I was really blown away by by how well they they played and sounded. And this was the first night of the tour. Um, but yeah. And but another thing blew me away, Paul, is the the way it had been a long time since I had seen Bill Kreutzmann play the, you know, the dead drum set drummer. Um, mm -hmm. And he plays behind the beat in a way that really kind of defines that Grateful Dead experience. He is driving that bus in, a, in, in that way. Like, I don't think anyone else could. Uh, so I, I got to pause you right here because yeah. that term behind the beat, my experience, I hear it a lot and, and I don't hear it used consistently as to what it means or what the result of playing that way is. So can you just pause for a second and just for my own edification, just kind of explain behind the beat. Yeah. So if you think of each, you know, each beat, um, each quarter note, if you will, as a as a circle instead of a point in time. Right. You can start to look and shift where that and, and really when we talk when I talk about playing behind the beat, I'm talking about where the snare drum is placed. Right. On a, it playing mm -hmm. as typical two and four groove, you know, boom, two, bat, two, right. And where that snare drum falls in relation to the beat. So it's not necessarily slowing things down when you say playing behind the beat. It's just the snare drum. Is it coming a little with behind the beat? It, it would come a little bit after where it could fall. Uh, and is it like the, the and E of? 
Yeah, you know, the, the, of the beat, the E of the B. Yeah, almost. I mean, I, if it were that far out, I think it would it would uh, potentially sound a little bit too herky jerky. It's it's just delayed by, you know, 30 milliseconds or something. Right. And it's it's this it makes things sound softer. Right. It makes the beat sound softer. And um, and and that. That creates a, a pocket that's very comfortable. And, and it, it, you know, Lisa and I, we had a two hour ride home after the show. So we were talking about it and she's like, gosh, you know, and they did play songs really slowly, um, especially as they started the night. Shakedown Street was what they opened with. And it, it felt like it was about half speed. But um, but that's just where they they put it these days. But even still, you know, I was saying to Lisa, uh, my wife. It, it's like Billy. uh plays in a way that's not so much about like the first if, if unless you're a deadhead and then and then you're used to it and it's fine but you know the first two or three songs you're like wow this is this really feels not only were the tempo slow but it you know that behind the beat thing is a very it creates a very relaxed vibe and and you know I, I, kind of the way it formed in my head was billy's not playing to excite the people right out of the gate here He's playing to create the vibe and selling tomorrow night's tickets, mm. right? You know, you're already here. You're already in the building. So I want to make you happy and feel good. And you're going to want to come back tomorrow. And and it really is that vibe because about halfway through the first set, it's like, okay, yeah, now I'm, now I'm into this. Now I can, uh, you know, now I can feel the groove, the way, it, the way they're playing it. It makes sense to me. And by the end of the night, you're like, yeah, this is great. But but he's playing really far behind and and not really hitting hard or really trying to 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 drive home that here's where the quarter note is kind of thing. It's it, the pulse is there. It's not like the tempo's changing or even fluid. It's very steady, but it's just very relaxed. And it's that behind the beat kind of thing. I, I would counter that if you want to hear something that's either right on or maybe even ahead of the beat. Go listen to Elvis Costello, right? That whole English driving kind of thing. It's like, you know, go listen to his version of like peace, love, understanding or pump it up or whatever. And those are like, you know, it's manic almost the way that feels. And that's is the behind the beat, a grooving thing. Is it, a, is it an R and B and jam band feel consistently in that type of music? Uh, R and B. Yes. Um, yeah, the the bass player in R and B generally will play right on top of the beat, and then you'll have the the drummer, at least with the snare drum, kind of playing behind it, and that creates that nice pocket. Um, jam bands, for the most part, yes, are are behind the beat kind of things, but but there are some that are that are not. Um, and and that and yeah, there's no there's no rule about where it has to be. I mean, uh, stylistically, again, R and B kind of has that. But um, but it, it's you know, it's uh, it's whatever works for the music. And, and sometimes you'll have a something that doesn't work. Right. You, you know, and, and that's I mean, that's I mean absolutely it. fascinating. But this it seems to me like that. It just that's a that's a feel thing. Like it's an almost, can you learn to play behind the beat? Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you kind of. Ha- well, I don't know that you have to. Um, I did. Uh, it, it was an intentional thing. And it really was that whole thinking of the beat like a circle. And where is that snare drum going to fall? Either, you know, treating the the pulse of it, the quarter note is always going to fall right in the middle. And that is mm-hmm. the quarter note. So com- com- communicating that that quarter note is where it is and then playing a little bit behind it. Again, just thinking of the beat as this circle that just keeps going round and round uh, as opposed to this, you know, pulse in time or moment in time. Uh, I don't know. Uh, like that's. It, it's a weird thing to to feel, but you know, listening to to a band like like the Grateful Dead or listening to Little Feet, like Richie Hayward was definitely someone that that mastered that whole playing behind the beat, but really pushing his his kick drum sort of on the beat, and again, it creates that big fat pocket. But but his his behind the beat is very different from Kreutzmann's behind the beat, right? You know, his was a very defined kind of, it was this laid back swampy thing with a really, like there was a snap to the beat. It was just a late snap. Whereas, but that, that's actually my question is, yeah. is behind the beat typically associated with kind of intermediate tempos. Do you ever hear behind the beat in really aggressive tempos? I don't know. I, and I don't know that you're going to hear ahead of the beat with really aggressive tempos either. I mean, it, it starts to be like the, the amount of slush that, 
that potentially exists narrows the faster the tempo is, right? Y- you know, you, you've got like, you know, if you're at right? But, you know, just, you know, it's hard to make that behind the beat, but you can. I mean, you certainly can sort of alter that a little bit where, you know, it, it nudges, it nudges behind and, and almost drags, but doesn't drag. So yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, no, it, it's, it's not a tempo thing necessarily. It's just a, it's a feel thing, you know, mm-hmm. where that, where that falls. And as, as a drummer, you know, it's almost like creating flams, right? You know, if you're playing eighth notes on your hi-hat uh, and, you know, whatever, one and three on your, uh, on the bass drum, you know, you don't want, if you're doing that, you don't want your snare to hit right on the money. You don't want it to be that. You want it to be, you know, and then and then that's sort of a way to begin to train yourself how that might feel to do that, and then and then you can start to kind of get into, uh, it, you know, how it how it all comes together. I don't know. Got it. Yeah, but it was really interesting watching Billy play that way because it was like, oh, this is. There's a science here, I, whether he's aware of it or not is, is, you know, a whole other conversation with it. You'd have probably have to have with him, but, um, mm. but you know, it's definitely his style and, and really definitive of how the dead's music certainly is live, but also like that whole, how it comes across live and, you know, having a big fat pocket like that and having things behind the beat definitely makes it easier for people to move and dance and that sort of thing. When you get that sort of Elvis Costello, you know, on the beat or ahead of the beat thing, basically what people can do is like bounce up and down and, and you know, that's it because there's no room to there's no there's no slush. So, mm. yeah. But that's, Technical I mean, term slush. Slush. Yeah. But that's where it is. It's slush. And the dead play with a lot of slush on the beat and it I, like it works for them. It's not a like I said the pulse isn't a uh there's not a, a very defining thing. It's just like yep, it's going to lope along and and the time will, the tempo will stay consistent, that's fine, but you know there's not this huge backbeat that's part of their thing. It's like yeah, we'll just imply, here we go. Okay, keep going. It's fine. Play your play your lines, sing your songs. You 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 dance, you twirl around. Everybody's having fun. It's a big party. You're good you're good to go. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um one last thing, I'm playing my um I'm playing guitar. I'm just a guitar player, no singing in uh this Fogarty tribute tomorrow night. Uh, my buddy Steve, who I sing in Acoustic Madness with, um, is the is John Fogarty. He's put a really great band together. And um, if you're in the Bay Area, I'd love if you guys to come out. I mean, tickets are on sale, and it's kind of a cool thing. Um, if you like Fogarty solo work, and if you like Credence, there's a couple of videos on my Facebook page that I've, I've shared of the rehearsals from it. Steve sounds an awful lot like Fogarty. I mean, he and which is Fogarty is ridiculously high in some of the traveling band is ridiculous full voice on an a totally you know, ridiculous yeah ridiculous you know uh, a fortunate son you know some of these things are crazy high um yeah anyway uh the band learned 30 songs wow 24 songs 24 songs and uh we I- had one rehearsal that was the first half of the show one rehearsal that was the second set of the show and one rehearsal that was a full run through of the show the good thing of course is 80% of these songs, you kind of know everybody it's, you know, if you're, if you're a guitar player, especially sure you, they're just kind of in you. And so, you know, you're just kind of brushing off going for the nuance there, but it's been a really tremendous amount of fun putting this together. My buddy, Steve sings his head off. He sounds great. And so check out some of those videos. Maybe I'll share one to the gig gab cool. uh, Facebook page. And um, yeah, so we got, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're in the Bay area, drop by, say hi to me, please. If you do drop by. So I have, and, I have uh, to, I have to stop there though, because we're recording this on Friday, but it doesn't release until Monday and the gig oh, actually happens right. on Saturday oh, in the oh, middle. Dude, <laughs> I forgot. Oh, Sorry folks. <laughs> I forgot. All right. Well, then then uh, wish me luck and I will report back in next week <laughs> on how awesome this show was. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I'll still I'll still share post it to some the page. information. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. I'll share it to the page. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Yeah. And that page, uh, that page I, is uh, my my cognizance of space and time is just out the window. I got to learn to say no a little bit more. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, actually, I'm glad you said yes to this gig because this sounds like a blast. So it's I think you'll have fun doing this. Yeah. What did you have in mind, Dave? What's that? 
well, what did you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a, it's a, yeah, exactly. What did you have in mind? Yeah. Now I get it. I'm caught up now. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah. Find us on that, uh, that Facebook page at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. And that will, uh, that will get you everything you need to know about what we're doing here. And you can talk with other musicians and all good stuff. Have a great uh, week, folks. I will uh, I will actually be out in your area, Paul, even though I don't think we're going to see each other. So, Oh, actually, we will see each other because you're playing a gig we'll that I think I'm going to. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'll see you Monday night. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Look forward to it. Hey, Dave, I'll always be performing when you yes, see Yes, you will. Take it easy. We'll see you next week.